Good evening. We've got some people that are still signing on to the webinar. Um, so what we would like to get started and be mindful of everybody's time this evening. I would just really like to welcome you all to Your Health Lecture Series, which is sponsored by Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine and co-sponsored tonight by Hope College and Holland Hospital. We are very happy that you've decided to join us tonight. One housekeeping item to start out with is there will be time at the end for questions and answers. Down in the bottom of your Zoom, you have a little Q&A section. If you could just drop your questions there, that would be um, awesome. And we'll be able to get to those and, uh, and get them to our speaker um, and get your questions answered at the end. So please feel free to drop questions into that Q&A section uh, for this evening's lecture. We're really, really so fortunate to have Dr. Lisa Lowry um, MDMPH here um, with us tonight um, to talk about um, health disparities, social injustice, and healthcare. And uh, Dr. Lowry is a physician um, specializing in adolescent medicine at Spectrum Hospital. She's also an associate professor um, for Michigan State's College of Human Medicine. In April of 2020, she was named to the College of Human Medicine's Assistant Dean for Diversity and Cultural Initiatives. She has her BS in microbiology from Michigan State, and she is a house divided as she got her MD from University of Michigan. She did a residency in um, medicine and pediatrics at Spectrum Hospital and followed that up with a fellowship um, in adolescent medicine at Johns Hopkins, where she was also awarded her uh, master's in public health, her MPH degree. So I would like to turn it over now to Dr. Lowry, and thank you very much, Dr. Lowry, for being with us and helping us to understand um, and face and address some of these things that we have coming at us um, now. So thank you very much, Dr. Lowry. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm so excited to face it, to address it. And we'll talk a little bit of, um, about that. That's a word play on something I'll mention later on. Um, for our objectives, we're gonna discuss how inequities impact one's health. We're gonna briefly discuss microaggressions and impact on healthcare. We're gonna discuss the, discuss how we can address some unconscious bias and discuss how we can use a diversity, equity, and inclusion or DEI lens to impact healthcare. And if you look at those objectives, you're like, wow, that's a lot. And each of those objectives, we could sit here and unpack for at least an hour or a day. So this is going to be um, just, we're going to just do some snippets. And when I talk about this work in a lot of times, I'll say we are just scratching the surface. And so we are really at that top of that, the tip of the iceberg. And you'll see, I like to use some themes in my, in my presentations. And as being a pediatrician at heart, I always tell people, do not take this one lecture as your diversity, equity, inclusion, or unconscious bias, that one conversation, but take it to hopefully spark some thought, spark some things that you can change or maybe have future conversations and make it an ongoing conversation. Or as the pediatrician in me would say, multiple series of shots uh, so that you can continue this work. And I also come into this space knowing that as an African-American cisgender woman, I come with a, a myriad of, of, of history. I'm born and raised in Grand Rapids. So that that even ch changes a little the lens that I come to you with. But I also want to know that we are all on this journey together. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is something I've been very passionate about. Um, but I do not consider myself an expert. Um, I may be a little further along or not as far as you are on your own personal journey. So we're gonna talk and um, have a lot of uh, unfortunately, not we can we cannot have open discussion, but we can uh, have some time in the Q and A. So I'm going to start with this, and we'll talk, have some little definitions throughout. But some of you might have seen the slide. There might have different versions of this slide. But briefly, we talk about this equity, equality, reality, and some people have um, a component of the slide that I'm showing here. This liberation, where you move away the barrier. So we're in the virtual world, so you can't see that. I'm five feet tall, but imagine me being five feet tall standing on the box next to my husband who's six two. So if we get the same box, one of us may not be able to see over the um, fence. So then if we talk about equity, you know, okay, I'm gonna get maybe two boxes to stand on. But some people will even say, go a little deeper and say, well, how did I get up on that box? Did somebody help lift me? Did I use a ladder? What went into that? But when we really, let's be very honest about the, the world we face 
um, and society, we all come with different at different levels. So some of us aren't even standing on a box. We come lower in the ground. Some of us have more boxes. Um, and then if you really, there's a, a component of that I, I heard um, someone pre present this and they said, what about the person in the middle? What are they thinking about? Are they indifferent to what's going on around them? They're just enjoying the game. You know, they're like, okay, you're a little tall, but you're not in my way. You're a little short, but you're not in my way. I got a perfect view. Um, but what if we remove the barrier? Um, and I've shown this slide where the barrier goes from a wooden fence to a fence with holes. But really, what if we um, look at and have remove the barrier? But I'm going to go a little step further. And I, um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Vega, had this discussion before, and I heard this. He said, really, if you look at it, it's just not the fence. But when we really look at social disparities, it's why am I over there on the side behind the fence anyway? Is it because I didn't buy a ticket? Could I not afford to go? Did I get there late and all the tickets were sold out? Um, or did I just prefer, I don't want to be sitting in that crowd and I prefer, prefer to stand where I can maybe catch the ball. But really, what is the mindset? Why are we over here uh, uh, behind the fence? Um, but the real social disparity is if I can't be in the bleachers, why not? And what separates me from those people in the bleachers versus me standing over here be behind the fence? And so there's a, another conversation I like to have with people and say, thank you for removing that barrier, but why can't I sit in the seats? And so we know when we look at health disparities and social disparities and social injustice, there are some people that will never, ever be able to sit in the seats. There'll be some people that be able to sit in the seats for a little while um, because we help them along. But when we really think at what, how we're going to impact, and I'll continue to bring it back to healthcare, how can we have health equity and uh, uh, address health disparities. So this is a quote that I love. It says, diversity is, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and we also have to say diversity, equity, and inclusion, diversity is actually being invited to the party while inclusion is you ask me to dance. Um, and I'm gonna take it another step to another quote that I have um, and actually have this um, on my wall. It actually says diversity is being invited to the party. When you include me, you actually ask me to dance. But if we look at equality, and again, that's kind of that going again in that inclusion and equality, it's actually to be part of the planning committee. And what I reason I want to draw attention to that is because so many times we in good meaning uh, public health people, health disparities, we go into a community and say, this is what's going on. This is how I'm going to address it. But do you ever talk to the people in the community and really get their feedback? Are they part of the planning process? And even when we talk about healthcare disparities and we talk about health equity and healthcare mistrust, a lot of times I'm going to bring it even back to that the COVID vaccine. We know that there's um, some medical mistrust with especially in communities of color with the COVID vaccine. So there have been several of us um, of color and in other groups where we have tried to be very instrumental in reaching out to our communities, our black and brown communities and saying, hey, I got the shot, you need to get the shot. This is where you can get the shot. This is why we think you should get the shot. And so really, but we were part of that planning process. Someone didn't just say, hey, Lisa, we're going to go do this, but they brought us to the table and said, okay, you and some others in the community, how can we do this to make sure um, that we are addressing um, some healthcare disparities in, in the example of that COVID vaccine and trying to make it more accessible? So we're going to switch lenses just a little bit and just talk about social determinants of health, and this will tie into a slide a little later on. Um, when we look at social determinants of health, and as healthcare providers, so often we want to fix things, we're fixers, we go into it to take care of people. But when we think about really what's impacting healthcare, you really want to think about its economic stability, neighborhood physical environment, education, food, community and social context, and then the healthcare system. And so, so little of what I can do once they get to my office. 
I can't really, I don't really necessarily have an impact of that. But we know that those things, if I have stable, um, a living wage, then I hopefully am with an employer that's providing health care that better a health care, like in the form of insurance, that's going to be that I have more opportunities to um, see my uh, primary care provider. Um, am I in a place that has um, uh, lead, high lead level? Or am I in a place um, where we talk about food deserts? We so often talk about uh, urban food deserts, but we also have issues with rural food deserts and access to food. So all those things really can impact health outcomes. So they can impact morbidity, mortality, life expectancy, functional limitations, and your health status. And so I'm also going to talk, I don't know if many of you have heard about this. This is called ACEs, which are called adverse childhood experiences. But we know that ACEs, um, these experiences, even as a child, they can impact me long term into my adulthood. So if there's a history of physical and emotional abuse, neglect, household dysfunction, mental illness, even a incarcerated relative, those things that even happened to me as a child can impact me as an adult. And we know looking at things like chronic stress and historical generational trauma, these stresses can actually alter our DNA functions. And this can actually be passed from generation to generation. So this is one of the things when we look at, again, tying into looking at those social determinants of health, how they can impact um, even us as children, and that how can have long-term health uh, ramifications. But when we really talk about the healthcare, when I'm doing what my job is, by the time they get to see me, is really I'm only impacting, or we as healthcare providers are really only impacting about 20% of healthcare. Um, and that's access to quality of care. So again, it, it depends. Are you using the emergency room as your primary care provider? Do you have adequate access? Can you take time off to go to the doctor? All those things. But when we think about that, those social determinants of health, those socioeconomic factors, your physical environment, um, clean water, uh, clean air, and then other things that people do, you know, I need to exercise, not smoke, um, make sure um, I'm using safer sex pressures, all those. So really all those things really impact. Um, and, and so those really what goes into your health. So I, you know, I hopefully can impact some of those healthier behaviors, but I think what's frustrating to us or can be frustrating to us as primary care providers or people in healthcare is there's so much that I don't necessarily feel that I can impact. So for example, I'll use a very timely example. A few months ago, uh, especially with a lot of the violence that was happening um, in Grand Rapids, we've, I had several of my patients who either got shot or their, their family members got shot. And I never forget, we, we were talking to this one young man um, and, and, you know, he's obese. And so we we're talking about going out and being more physically active and going outside. And he was like, yeah, I really don't feel comfortable you know, my cousin just got shot. So I don't feel like I can go outside and run around. I don't feel safe. So really learning how to meet those, our patients where they are and have those honest conversations. Okay, so you don't feel safe when I saw, what can we do in your house? You know, is it walking up and down the steps? Is it doing those type of things? But having those honest conversations, but also being aware where um, to the impact um, that are the social economic things, those factors, those those social contexts that that's having on our patients. So Kamara Jones, Dr. Kamara Jones, when we talk about health equity, she defined health equity as the assurance, assurance of the condition of optimal health for all people. So I'm assuring that you got this, not just that we've attained it, because attaining means, okay, I've got it, now what do I'm doing? But if we can assure that everyone can get some health equity, and that, um, that health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. That again, it's not just, okay, oh, we got health equity, but it's, a, it's, it's really a process rather than the final outcome. So we should always be looking at how can we improve you know, housing? How can we improve better education? How can we improve these things? And so really going back to saying, okay, not that we just saw, well, we might solve it over here, but do we solve it? Um, uh, more globally or more um, in, um, in a wider community context. 
when you look at Healthy People 2030, and I'm not going to read this, they actually had some overarching goals. And I just wanted the third goal. The third goal is to eliminate health disparities, achieve health equity, attain health literacy to improve the health and well being of all. And so, again, we need to be uh, hopefully not just we're striving for this, but making it an insurance. And that's how we're going to help eliminate health disparities. And this is a heavy lift. And if anyone, you know, 2020, if one of the things that 2020 showed us is how fragile um, and, and how desperate our, our, our healthcare system is across communities. Um, and so, and then a passion of mine, aside, another passion is really health literacy. Um, I am amazed. I, I deal with teenagers and young adults, but I'm still amazed at how many people feel like they need to call my office just to get a get a a, um, a refill. So you may know, and I may know that you know what Dr. Smith has sent in. You know my medicine, and I have multiple refills. But some people are just saying, "Well, I, I aren't I supposed to call the doctor when I need a refill?" Or you know, I I took my blood pressure medicine for thirty days and I'm out, so I thought I was better. So again, those are just some brief examples, but how do we help our patient? And that's not even really getting into when we get to um, language barriers and that's a whole nother um, discussion, but how do we continue to assure and work on those health disparities? So health inequity is that uneven distribution of social and economic resources that Im impact one health. So maybe I get a small box, you get a large box, you get three boxes. And we know that inequities can lead to disparities and disparities can lead to poor outcomes. So again, really uh, just driving from that theme. And we really, when we look at uh, disparities versus inequities, and I got this slide from Dr. Deborah Braholden, when you look at disparities, there are differences. Inequities are unfairness. Disparities can be person-centered. Inequities tend to be systems or structures. Um, she has this great example of when we think of disparities as downstream. So when what's going on right here in this, this, this one group, but really what's going on when we think of it upstream, what is really going on further upstream that impacts the disparity further downstream? And then we're going to talk about race versus racism. Again, again, looking at, again, we talked about those social determinants of health. So what upstream is really impacting economic stability. Is it that we don't have a, um, you know, over here, I only make $12 an hour. Well, why do I make $12 an hour? Because that's as much as, you know, company A can afford to pay me. But why is that? Well, because of, you know, funding or because of government. So when we look at those things, we could try to, to address them downstream, but can we address them upstream? My patient doesn't have a, a ride, can't get to my doctor's office, their doctor's office. Well, why can't they get to their doctor's office? Because they don't have transportation. Well, why don't they have transportation? Don't, aren't you on a bus line? Well, not really. Well, the buses run, you know, every 30, 35 minutes. And, you know, my patient's not on a bus line. Well, how can we even think about that if we're looking at it more upstream? How can we impact that? Um, and again, the frustrating part is, Sometimes when we're here in the office, we can't necessarily in, impact that. But I will say that if we advocate and work together, we can impact and um, gradually and slowly impact these. So we're going to talk a little bit about just a little a different health disparity, and this one is zip code. Your zip code is most important predictor of your health and well-being, um, and all zip codes are not created equally. So what I did is I there's this. Um, website, uh, Robert Wood um, Foundation, you can go on here, you can actually just put on, put in your zip code, and this is life expectancy, and so I did 49423, I googled hope, and they, that's what it came up as zip code, and so that's Ottawa County, 49423, it said, you know, basically, for on average, now we know with, you know, within counties, it's different, um, 81 years, is um, my life, the life expectancy. However, if I did 49503, which is actually where my office is um, in downtown kind of Grand Rapids, my life expectancy average would be 75. And so what is it? Now, again, not this is, you would say probably an oversimplification because you could say, well, I know people in, in, in Ottawa County, if you're in this part and things like that, but just wanted to kind of give you that bigger scope. 
Now I'm going to bring it a little closer home. Now, um, a lot of you um, may or not, may not be familiar with Grand Rapids, but my home, um, Grand Rapids. So if you're familiar with Grand Rapids, it's Grand Rapids and East Grand Rapids. And more, if you think about Blodgett versus Butterworth, Blodgett is in East Grand Rapids, Butterworth is downtown. Um, so if I, and 49507 is where actually I grew up. My father, my parents still live in the 49507 area. So if the life expectancy in 49507, 75 years, East Grand Rapids, within two to three miles, 90 years. So, and there's actually a joke that I have, um, the, the street that I live on, if you go four blocks away from my father, you go into East Grand Rapids. And the name of the street changes. So what is going on? Are we just healthier in East Grand Rapids four blocks away? But what are the economic disadvantages or those social constructs that make a 15 year difference within a two mile radius? Okay, so just, just something I just want you to think about. All right, so when we're addressing health equity, um, you know, we need to be explicit. We need to identify and effectively address racism and implicit bias. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. We're going to adopt an all in health and all policies approach. So we're looking at this. How does it impact health disparities? Looking at, you know, transportation. How can it impact health? Um, create an internal organization of wide culture and equity. This is actually from the APA, a, APHA um, and their thoughts about health equity. And we're going to respect and involve communities in health equity initiatives. Again, talking about just don't saw, you know, say, oh, this is what we're going to do and then just bring it into my neighborhood. You know, actually, if you live in, you know, East Grand Rapids, and then you're gonna try to solve the problems in, in my neighborhood of 49507, you should probably ask me um, what you're gonna do. And then measure and evaluate progress in reducing health disparities because it can be very daunting. Um, and, it's, and it's very longitudinal. And that's the thing, sometimes we can't just flip a switch and say, oh, look it, we did this one thing and it's impacted health uh, disparities. Um, so those are, this is this one of their suggestions. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about racism. Um, if you know a little bit about social um, injustice and talk briefly just about race and racism, um, racism has been um, defined and undeniably a public health issue. And I'm going to demonstrate to you why. But few, before that, some definitions. Race actually really is a social construct that artificially divides people into distinct groups based on certain physical characteristics or, or appearance particularly skin color. Um, um, it can be also related to some ancestral heritage, cultural affiliation, cultural history, ethnic um, classification. But we actually know, and they looked at that, race really is when you look at people even within races and their, their race really doesn't necessarily impact your biology. And so there's really a whole, there's a slight movement thinking of what, when do we, um, why do we continue to look at race in certain measurements such as pulmonary function tests and uh, glomerular filtration rates, which is glomerular filtration rate when we're looking at kidney disease. But again, that's a whole nother subject. But I, and I don't want to um, get, get, go down that, that space a long time. But when we talk about racism, and we're going to talk about, and there's many definitions of racism, but this is the one that I, I like particularly. It's the belief in the superiority of one race over another, which often results in discrimination and prejudice towards people based on their race or ethnicity. And at its most basic level, racism is a lens through which people interpret, neutralize, and reproduce inequality. So when we talk about racism, what really goes into racism? Well, again, tying to that uh, iceberg, there's the things people say. You, you know, there's microaggressions, macroaggressions, racial insensitivity, but below that, and this is what a lot of people are saying that overbearing that makes sometimes when you say, oh, I got to deal with this, it, um, is those things, housing discrimination, access, uh, education, redlining, um, fair hiring and firing, education disparities, limited access to resources. And so a lot of times when you hear people talk about that structural 
and institutionalized racism. These are the things a lot of times, and they're sometimes very hard to pick out. Um, you know, it's easier to say if someone's, you know, saying a slur or doing something overtly, um, microaggressions, you can feel that. But some of these things you're like, this is happening to our communities or it's happening to people on um, not just an individual, but a societal and community level. So how does racism impact healthcare and health healthcare um, outcomes when you basically impact, you use racism and act on racism and you don't have equitable education, you don't have equitable transportation, you don't have equitable access to healthcare services, housing or public safety, all of those things, racism, again, looking at those social determinants of health can ultimately impact health outcomes. So this is just one on the side, I, I will want to share this with you. I'm very proud, I do work for Spectrum Health, Helens of Children's Hospital, um, and the leadership here um, actually said, you know what, we're identifying it as a uh, racism, as a public health crisis, but also there is a pledge to act and what can we do at multiple macro and micro levels within Spectrum Health and also within our communities, you know, because, and the thing, when you think about Spectrum Health, a lot of people think about Grand Rapids, but really Spectrum Health has a foothold of about 13 different counties. And so when we just broadly um, trying, how do we address that across all of our patients that we serve? And then how do we make it when we, when patients feel warm and welcome, when they enter um, our, our, our doors. And again, I could not do this talk or presentation without just saying, you know, it was MLK's birthday uh, last month and we celebrated it, um, Black History Month this month. And then again, the snippet of this often quote, you'll see a lot of times of all the forms of inequality injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and humane. So we really have to, you know, it's really looking at how do we care for people? How do we make it equitable? How do we address all these, these um, disparities to overall improve health out outcomes? So I'm going to do a little shift um, and just really talk about, we talked about racism, we talked about um, uh, race and racism, um, but really talking about just diversity. And when you think of diversity, I, it's not lost on me that we think, okay, all right, you know, she, if you looked at me um, uh, or if you saw me walking in the room, you go, okay, she's probably uh, African American, you know, I don't know. You would say, you know, she's short, you know, she looks, she's dressed cisgender female, all those things. But again, diversity is so much more. We have organizational diversity, your thoughts, your beliefs, um, sexual orientation. I did conclude race here, even though we did talk about being just a social construct. And then there's generational diversity. Um, you know, when we talk about, and this is one I always kind of talk about with our with our my colleagues and how you know we say um, millennials often get a bad rap. Um, you know, and then but I always think millennials have, they're bright, they're, they're, they're nuanced, and I love learning from them, but I think the problem is um, sometimes millennials go, well, those, those baby boomers or those, those Gen Xers, they don't know what they're talking about, and, and vice versa, but anyway, diversity is so much, and again, someone could look at this and say, well, Lisa, you don't have this as diversity, you don't have that as diversity, but just to kind of say diversity is just more than what's necessarily on our outside, and so when we're thinking again, I talked a lot about looking at things from a diversity, um, equity and inclusion lens. I would be remiss as we talk about how do we treat each other? How can we bring our entire selves? And so when we talk about bringing ourselves into a particular space, can you truly bring your entire self to work or to school or in a particular space? Um, and when we talk about that really is, do we create spaces in which people feel comfortable to be themselves or do people cover? And just here's a definition. And if you look at some, there's some data that says anywhere from 20 to 80% of people cover at some point. Um, 
and but covering is to downplay a disfavored trait in order to blend into mainstream because all of us possess some stigmatized attributes um we will all encounter pressure to cover and really not necessarily being ourselves and again i think it's important that we all provide spaces especially i'll put it in my in, in my front door that when patients walk into my office i'm providing a, uh, an affirming, supportive environment. Um, and because we want people to be open, we want our patients to be able to share with themselves. We wanna be able to have open conversations because if a patient is not fully being open or sharing their complete self with me, then I might miss something. I'm more likely to miss something. And we all come into certain spaces with biases. And so, Lisa Lowry has biases. You, whoever's on this this webinar, have biases. Um, and I and bias, unconscious bias, are these unattended, subtle, or subconscious thoughts that happen to us all the time. They can be ingrained mind bugs that lead to errors in how we perceive, remember, reason, and make decisions, or even interact with others. And so, a lot of times when we're rushed. Um, when we don't have the complete story, when we're distracted, we always, we can, we can revert back to uh, a bias. Um, and we would like to think that we're open-minded, um, fair, and without bias, but research, there's a ton of research that shows otherwise. Um, and it's often uncomfortable to realize this for most of us. Dr. Benahi has done a lot of work in this area. I challenge you, you can read her, uh, her book, or if you don't have time to read the book, there's a TED talk. It's about 20, 25 minutes just talking about biases. And a lot of times when I'm doing some certain trainings and I know, you, you know, you come in and people are like, oh, oh, we're going to talk about diversity and equity and inclusion. We're going to talk about unconscious bias. And people feel like, oh, but here we go. And I usually start with just a, just a simple, we all have biases. And people go, well, and people kind of get like a little uncomfortable. And I'm like, okay, let's, let, let's, let's go back. Coke or Pepsi, uh, Diet Coke versus Coke Zero, um, you know, Michigan State, then I go Michigan State versus Michigan or, you know, Ohio State. And really people go, uh, it can, not that I'm minimizing deep rooted unconscious bias, but again, kind of putting in the framework, okay, so now let's talk, we all have bias, we still are in bias. So really kind of saying we all have bias, but it's most important to number one, how do you impact biases? You become more aware that you have them and then you work on them. And unconscious biases, they're pervasive and robust. They don't necessarily align with our declared beliefs. And we typically hold biases that favor our own in-group. The problem is our unconscious biases can have real world uh, effects on our behavior. But we can learn to control our responses to uh, unconscious bias and not act on them. And more importantly, there's a slide here. How do you interrupt these biases? Well, you got to be intentional, acknowledge and be motivated to change. Okay. And some of our biases come from where, how you were brought up, um, your exposure, uh, what you're fed by media, all these things. They're also um, studies that show that you even, um, your memories and, 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 and things that you've been exposed to even as a child, those can impact your biases. You want to give attention to when stereotypical responses or assumptions can be activated. And then you have to take time to practice new strategies designed to break the automatic associations and be aware of times when biases are gonna come into play. Again, whether you're in a new area and you're uncertain or when you're rushed or distracted. So you have to make these systemic changes. News, Dr. Lowry is in true transparency. I continue to work on this because, you know, or sometimes I, I was like, oh, I didn't even realize I, that was a bias. Um, there's, um, there's some, and not going into that, you can even do, there's the Harvard implicit, the IAT test. If you ever have time, take them. Um, um, there's, I don't know, about 50 or 60 that you can take. Um, some people think they're um, a little biased in how you take them. But again, they can say, oh, okay, I didn't even realize that was a thing. And maybe you don't feel it's a thing. I didn't realize I had that bias. But then you can be aware of it. 
Um, and that, and then maybe aware that in stressful situations or in, in, in unknowing situations, you may be act on it. And the reason we talk about microaggressions and we talk about um, implicit bias and unconscious bias and stereotypes, because they can all interact um, so where you're making judgments or characteristics attributed to specific groups, or you can make um, microaggressions, subtle verbal or nonverbal insult, or you can have these subconscious attitudes or perceptions that can influence um, your understanding and action. So, so when we talk about microaggressions, microaggressions are defined as subtle, um, everyday, and essential, oftentimes unintentional interactions or behaviors that um, communicate some sort of bias towards historically marginalized groups. And the difference between microaggressions or over discrimination or macroaggressions is that people often commit microaggressions and they don't even know that they've done it. Um, so I threw some examples up here and, you know, um, no, where are you really from? Well, I, I, I'm from Grand Rapids. No, like, Really, you're, you're from Grand Rapids? Um, or, you know, you're American? Oh, so you speak English. Um, this is one I know a lot of my learners have to deal with, especially some of that, my younger learners um, that are, are, are docs. They walk into the room and the, the family says, oh, hold on, um, let me get off the phone. The, the nurse just walked into the room. And so, you know, these are some microaggressions. Um, uh, oh, really? You don't look, um, you don't act gay. So these are just a few, we could be here all night talking about microaggressions, but I just want to put some on, put uh, some examples up there, but possible responses to microaggressions. And again, the biggest thing I, I see with people with microaggressions, especially if you've been a victim of microaggression, the biggest thing you go is, wait a minute, did that just happen? And then you're kind of replaying it. And then sometimes what happens, a lot of people go back, you know, they'll talk to the next day, hey, I was in this situation and they said this, what were you thinking? And so sometimes a lot of people actually kind of play them, play them out in their brain and, 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 and they're like, did that really happen? But if you're pretty sure, or you're sure that this was a microaggression, there's, there's ways you can address them. You can ask for more clarification um you can ask for a separate intent from an app impact meaning you know i know you didn't realize this but when you said x this was offensive because of y um and what you could do is try using this language um share your own process i noticed that you said blank um i used to say that too but i learned that you should say x you know, you know, I noticed that you used the word colored. Well, we don't use the word colored anymore. Another better way would be use, you know, uh, African-American or ask how what somebody would like to be referred to. Um, again, these can be used by the victim, but also the bystander. And so a lot of, there's a lot of um, studies and literature out there about being the bystander and how do you you know, address microaggressions when you're sitting, when you're sitting or standing there and see it happen. Um, there's a lot of different ones. This is another one. D stands, you describe the situation. You, um, uh, E stands for expressing the feeling of the experience, um, asking or asserting uh, to be specific about addressing the microaggression and reinforce to make sure that the listener is open to feedback. Now, a lot of times people will say, yeah, Lisa, that all sounds good. You know what? If I did that every time I had a microaggression against me, I wouldn't be able to do that. I'd just be responding to microaggressions. But again, in due time, again, sometimes you go, oh, it was a microaggression, but sometimes you really need to address it because it's good for your own mental health. And it's also good for the person that who's, has committed the microaggression. Or if you're the bystander, you know, advocating for that person saying, you know, you, and again, everybody language, you, you shouldn't have said that. And the person goes, oh, why? well, this is why. Again, the opposite is you can try to use micro affirmation. And this is where we really are greeting our colleagues with sincerity. We're really trying to connect to that person, um, person to person, um, being present, which is really hard now a lot of times in this virtual world, but you know, not looking at the screen, turning the screen on, leaning in, all those things. Um, being present to that person, 
paraphrase, paraphrase or, or empathize. So this is what I thought you said. Did I hear you right? And then appreciate and praise strength and contributions. And so those are ways that either as a person, um, you can use that as a form to, uh, to a micro affirmation or even um, as, as, as a bystander working through that, that worth that victim, you can really use that to, um, because it can be a traumatic experience, you can help that person work through that microaggression. So other strategies of how we can um, mitigate unconscious bias, and I like this one because this looks at multiple levels, the organization, the division of the both. And you may say, and I always say, use your little sphere of focus. You may say, well, I'm just a, you know, I'm just a student. I don't have power. I'm not, you know, I'm not here. But you do have, start with the little sphere. And maybe it's at that individual level where you're just learning and reflecting. Maybe you're just saying, you know what, I'm going to that webinar on, you know, February 16th to hear this talk questioning and actively countering stereotypes. Um, you can do both where you're mentoring, sponsoring, um, having some cultural humility and curiosity, and then intent intentionally diversifying those experiences. If you're in leadership, commit to culture change, um, have meaningful diversity training. I know um, here at the, at the hospital, a lot of times we we start every moment with a safety moment or a grateful moment. Um, but have you ever thought about starting with a diversity, a DEI moment? Um, uh, maybe it's uh, watching this TED talk and that that's, um, you know, 20 or 30 minutes and then everybody talking it briefly for about two to three minutes. Um, so, you know, those are some things that you can just do in your space to make your space um, a more uh, affirming space. And again, there is so, so, so much work to be done. Um, again, and you, we are all at different levels on this journey. We are on different spaces. Like I said, you may feel like, well, I'm a leader and you know, how do I impact my space? Or you might say, well, I'm new at this job and I don't wanna ruffle feather, feathers. There's just a lot of work to be done. But I always, and I, I started doing this when, when I do this presentation or similar presentation, I'll go, your call to action. Begin with your sphere. Don't hide and don't be afraid. It's really scary to do this because the biggest thing is you don't want to be, oh, I don't want to be a troublemaker. I don't want to do this. Um, I, or I want to learn more. Um, and then be aware that change, these changes of how we're going to impact health disparities and, and, and improve um, does not happen overnight. And for some people, just even having these conversations, change can be scary. But I want, I want to go back. Sometimes you can feel like this person pushing this boulder up a hill. But if we're all doing this work, if we're all working together, you know, you can have some people pulling up the hill. You can have some people pushing the boulder up the hill. But eventually, we're going to get up the hill. Um, and then my other call to action that I've used is acknowledging, and again, everyone's going to be different, acknowledging that there is a problem. Um, and if you don't think you have biases, you're wrong. And you might be the problem. I always tell people, you know, look, start by looking at the person in the mirror um, and knowing that we have, we all, we all, and I'm including myself, we all have work to do. Improve your culture in your space, in your classroom, in your office. If you see something, say something. And that helps going from just standing there being a bystander to actually being an advocate for someone. Um, move from being just an ally. Um, I, I, I heard this at a conference years ago and I've continued to use it. You know, ally is someone that, oh, great, Lisa, what an accomplice actually helps you get something done. And so if, you know, if you're an ally, I'm gonna challenge you to move to a, be an accomplice. And then how can you sponsor someone either with a micro affirmation or sponsoring someone? Are you a leader in a certain space and you need to say, you know what, I'm going to, um, you know, sponsor whomever, Joe, because I think they would be great at this. But then let me tell you something awesome. If you sponsor someone, if you ask them to do something, give them the right resources and the support um, and then do the work. And because it's a lot of work to be done and the work can be overwhelming. And so I told you, I started off with this, you know, face it, address it. Really, this is from a quote 
Um, we've been using um, this quote that we've been doing here with the residency program, a 21 week racial equity challenge. It's a version of the 21 day racial equity challenge. But um, this quote is not, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing that is changed can be, excuse me, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And so when we're talking about these health disparities, social injustice, you know, inequities, we got to face them. We got to start somewhere. Um, I sometimes have a slide where I have, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. Um, and again, the work starts with you. It starts with us um, being brave, being humble, being intentional, being dedicated, um, all those things. Um, but lastly, 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 and I tell this, take care of yourself, take care of your, 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 your colleagues, because this work, while it is inspiring and motivating, it can be very exhausting. So with that, I want to say thank you for this time. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to close out and then open it up for questions. And I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen. I would encourage anybody who has any questions to go ahead and drop them in the Q&A. Dr. Lowry, we do not have any current open questions right at this point. Oh, yep, yes, we do. Um, hi, Dr. Lowry. So thankful for your advocacy and leadership. Spectrum Health took a bold step last year in recognizing that racism is a public health crisis. As more healthcare systems recognize the connection, how do you think it will change the healthcare field? Oh, okay. So I'm I, I'm hopefully optimistic. Um, I'm also telling people I this is long overdue. And so I'm hopefully optimistic in the sense that I hope people not only say we're gonna do it um and put money behind it, and not only put money behind it, but people put people in places to actually do the work. So I know that's a heavy lift. Um, I would love for it, and this is again one of those long-term goals, how do we know what does the change look like? Um, and it can be changed at so many levels, um, whether it's diversity of workforce, you know, um, being more community involvement and engagement. So I'm hoping that we will, I'm optimistically hopeful that we will see, see change um, and hope in my, in my lifetime and it will get, things will get better. Our next question is, do you have any tips in confronting superiors or supervisors when they commit microaggressions? It can be difficult due to the power dynamic, but I've had situations where superiors have done that. Yeah, that, that, that is really, tri really tricky. And so it depends. Now, it depends on your personality and depends on your relationship with supervisor and depends on when it happens. So some of the times what I would recommend, and de depending on that, is, is kind of set up a meeting sooner than later or say, hey, and if I'm going to say, Lisa, can we set up a time not to, I just need a few minutes to discuss this. Um, and, and then kind of using some of those strategies that some of those things that we talked about, that could be helpful. Um, and then this is one of the things, take, take the opportunity, and this is where it gets tricky. You may, you want to take the opportunity to educate, but I will forewarn people, sometimes you may leave not in agreement. And that's one of the, the tricky things because sometimes we want to be in this space and we want to have a conversation by the end. They should see what they was wrong and do what's right. Um, that it might be not on that quite at that level of that journey. So, but really set, taking the opportunity to maybe pull them aside and say, hey, when you make this um, statement, again, you may be also the type of person that depending on the space you're in, you may say, hey, Lisa, um, you know, when you made that statement about, you know, all people, you know, people being in the country by three years should learn English, that was really kind of inappropriate, you know, maybe take that opportunity to educate. Again, it depends on if you feel that 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 superior is going to be more open for, to you addressing them in a bigger form or more one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Our next question is, what advice do you have for white healthcare providers for how to work effectively with patients of color? And what can current white college students do to be prepared to work well with patients of color? Yeah, thank you. Very good, very good question. And so I think, and this is gonna sound 
take as much time to really enter, get to know that person on that personal level. Um, my mentor, Dr. Shads, um, who said, he said, when you walk into a room, there's like four people in the room. There's that person and the, or the patient and their history and their experience. And then there's you and your history and your experience. And so really kind of taking the, and learning about that patient, kind of getting an, a, an experience and knowing that patient's experience, those I think are, are what's very important and meeting that person where they are. Um, and so the person may, for example, why are they not taking the blood pressure medicine? Um, well, did they not go to the pharmacy? You know, so many times, especially us as healthcare providers, we go, well, they're not taking that medicine because they're, they're non-compliant. We'll kind of try to kind of feel the, the, try to get the experience from that patient, that patient's lens. Um, and I think there was another question, but I totally forgot. I'm sorry. I don't know if I what asked can, well. What can current white college students do to be prepared? Yeah, I think the more you learn, the more you can interact. Interact again with that. Expand your low, your 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 um your uh, uh uh your surf your circumference. Who are you interacting now with now? Um, you know, you gotta be careful because you don't want to be like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go interact with Lisa because she's black and learn. All, and because the other thing is, people don't want to be like, hey, ask me for all the black people, or you know, I interact with so and so because they're ex. Um, but really, learn and try to get to know people and learn experiences. Um, there is, and the other thing is, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of information, good, reliable information out on the internet, the, the Fenway group. Um, uh, there's a group, uh, Boston, uh, Brown um, University has a lot of information on healthcare disparities and microaggressions. So the more, but I think the more you can have that, those personal interactions, the better off you can be. Thank you so much for being here to talk with us, Dr. Lowry. What are some of the best tactics you use with your patients who feel discriminated against, who need an advocate and who truly need long-term systemic changes to benefit their health? Wow, that's a good. First of all, I listen. I, I do I, I do a lot of, I, I do this. I let people tell their story. I let people tell their story twice. And usually once by the third time, I'm like, okay, I got it. But really kind of me figuring out where can I fit in? You know, um, and really having a, the honest conversation with people. Um, and sometimes people don't want you to solve their problems. People just want you to listen. Um, but really having, um, engaging with that person. Okay, and really kind of figuring out what's going on um, and then where you can and help. And sometimes it might be, you know, okay, this is a resource. Um, this is where I, these are the next steps. Maybe even, you know, I've even practiced um, with some of my patients because I've worked with teenagers and young adults. Okay, you feel like this is going on at work. How are you going to address it? Let's sit down and talk. Are you maybe write out a, some stuff, some talking points so you don't go into your 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 um your boss's uh boss's office mad. So some of those things are just kind of some of those little those little nugget conversations that you just kind of have to keep it simple with people. Um, has addressing someone else's implicit or explicit bi bias backfired on you as a black woman in medicine? I have concerns about this as I'm a pre-med student who's a black woman as well. Um, wow, that is a really good question. I don't think so. Um, no one has actually told me. Um, I think it's just kind of where you are and how you address it. Um, and taking the opportunity to educate. And sometimes, honestly, you just like, oh, I just don't feel like educating today. Um, but I really don't think it's, it's taken that much of, of, a, of, a, of a toll on me. Um, I've, I think the other, the other thing I've done is if you don't say something, it's going to continue. They're going to make you know, whether it's a, whether it's a microaggression and they just didn't know it, they don't know no better, but they think of how that experiencing that, even if you were the bystander, how that made you feel. And do you want to continue that to continue on that behavior to continue on and make the and continue that situation? Do you want to change the situation? So I think sometimes if you go into it, with that sense that I'm going to try to improve the situation for my colleague or the next person up, um, it can also soften some of 
because it is emotional. Let's get it out. It is emotional, but it can kind of soften that, that conversation. And then again, I, I always enter the conversation. Sometimes it's an edge. You're going to have the opportunity to educate and you might, will maybe not leave on, in, a, um, on agreement, in agreement. I love this next question. I was wondering whether you have encountered microaggressions in your work setting before, and what would you do if the microaggression is from a patient? Wow. Um, so yes, um, not recently, I will, uh, will say. Um, now, I will say I have had some colleagues more recently um, were had some micro and macro aggressions where people just said, I don't, you know, you're X and I don't want you to take care of me. I think, um, I, I, so it has been, I will honestly, I don't think it's been recently. I do think sometimes in the business world, people do underestimate you. And so I will say, if anything, my experience has been kind of been in some leadership roles and people have kind of underestimated me. I think the biggest thing is, um, I, I have a kind of a variable trust of different mentors. And so I can always run, talk to my mentor and say, okay, this is what happened. What do you think? How should I handle that? Um, but and then sometimes you just really have to take the, the, the circle back and say, okay, what's going on here? Why did this happen? And then again, for me, I don't want it to continue to happen. So I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't had anything recent where someone just didn't want to see me because of X, um, but yeah. Um, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> That's so, okay. As a healthcare provider, how would you rebuild trust with a patient after unconsciously committing a microaggression yourself? Oh man, um, you, you, have to, you just have to own up to it. Um, whether it's using inappropriate pronouns, um, saying something, um, I tell a story um, that, and I never get this, I walked into a room and assumed the person was Spanish speaking. I never get, I was an intern and to this day, remember it, and it was like 20 years ago. Um, and was like, oh, um, I'm waiting on the Spanish interpreter. I'll give you the short version. And they were like, well, we don't speak Spanish. Um, cause in my mind, I saw Brown and that was Spanish. And, and so I was so embarrassed that I, wa I said, you know what, let me try this again. And I walked out the room and came back in and reintroduced myself. And so you just really have to own up to it and apologize. Um, what, you know, even, you know, um, I, I, for some of my patients, um, I, you know, if I miss the user pronoun, I'll just say, I'm sorry, you know, and, and, and move on. And I think really, if people, once people notice that you, it's really coming from a place of I'm trying to do better and I, oops, you know, then people usually go, oh, okay. You know, they, they, they will give you the grace. Um, we have a question this uh, from someone who says this work takes toll on me as an African-American woman. What do you do to reduce the level of stress and weathering that comes with being a black female, a black healthcare provider and living in Grand Rapids? Ooh, all right. Um, yes, I think so. First of all, you have to have though you have, first of all, you have to own up to it and be like, mm, this takes time. Yep. And like I said, when you have my you're like, yeah, I'm just, I'm not the person I can't educate that person today. And you have to own up to it. Who are in your circle that you can have those honest conversations with. And the other thing is those conversations that with those people may not look like you, you have to have that safe space, those pop-off valves. Um, and then you also have to practice self-care and just, you know, whether it's, I'm going to go be by myself, I'm going to take a walk, I'm going to, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a person of faith, you know, so I'm going to have to go and pray on it. I'm going to have to pray for that person right now. Um, you know, and, and so those, those are the things that I do that renew me. Um, and so, and, and that's, that's how I, I, I continue to do it. And know that, you know what, you're not going to, Rome or whoever was not built for the day, and we're just here and we're, we're just going to keep chipping away at it, chipping away at it, and making it better. And I, my goal is that there, there are providers that have done it for me, now I'm doing it for others. And now I look at these, these more residents and medical students, and I'm like, oh, you know, wow, we have more and more. The, it's not solved. It is not solved. We have a long way to go um, for making it a more welcome environment for people of color in Grand Rapids but we're getting better. I love this next one. Hi, Dr. Lowry. Thank you for your time and this insightful presentation. What changes to healthcare delivery do you think would be the most impactful in addressing healthcare disparities on a broader scale? 
Yeah. Wow. That, 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 that's a big, that's a, that's a big, that's a question. question. Um, you know, I, I really think you really have to, if I could wave a magic wand, you have healthcare ingrained in the community. Um, and I, and I have to say, I don't know what that looks like, you know, but how do we, 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 we work on fixing our communities and integrating in our communities, whatever that looks like. And it's not, the problem is it's going to be different for everybody else. And I think that's where we kind of start seeing change. Um, but yeah, that, 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 that's a, that's a big lift. That is, that is a big one. That's a good question. I have to ponder on that one. Do you see social determinants of health and disparities in, in healthcare being adequately addressed in medical school curriculum? And what does that look like? Oh, wow. So it's better. It's not great. Um, even I can talk, tell you our, our um, uh, MSUCHM uh, medical students are always holding our feet to the fire about this. Um, Y'all can do this a little better. This is good, but change this, which is great because it's a lip curriculum to be a living, breathing. Um, I will say it's better, um, but definitely it needs to not be a one and done. So it should be woven continuously in. And so that's where I think we continue to have to improve it in healthcare curriculum. Um, so it's just not one lecture, your first year, or the second lecture, and then we're going to talk about this, your third year. But just as, just as we're talking about, you know, I don't know, you know, acid and base and then how do you treat it in the hospital and fluids we and electrolytes we kind of need to continue to weave it throughout the curriculum how do you build these strong relations with patients when your interaction time with them can be so limited it seems like this level of trust would take years and sometimes that isn't always an option it it, it is hard i will tell you some of the little snippets that i do I kind of put notes in the chart that I know that, you know, they went to Ottawa Hills High School or they like volleyball or their their pet's name is JoJo or something like that. Um, I'm also fortunate that I have anywhere 15 to 30 minutes because I do both primary and subspecialty care. So I do, don't, in true transparency, I don't have that 15 minute time crunch a lot of primary care providers are. But I really is thinking about just learning your patients on that personal level um, and, and, and just kind of developing those personal relationships. And, the, and some of the tricks I do is just kind of learn that personal thing so that I'm like, how's your mom? You know, did she go to, you know, did she make it back from Tennessee or something like that? Those are those little snippets. And um, you develop those lifelong relationships. I mean, I've been doing this what now 16 years. So, you know, I've had patients, I just actually had two patients today, like they were upstairs um, in the practice with their kids and stop by to say hi. And, you know, those are the heartwarming things that we, we do. Um, but those relationships can take time. But I also think the biggest thing is that your, your, the, your patients know that they can be themselves. And a lot of times they may not be your, themselves on the first visit. It may take two or three visits for them to be comfortable with you. Um, and sometimes that takes time. And so you might have to bring them back and follow up. But, but once they know that you're there and being consistent, and advocating for them, that's where you develop those relationships. How has the movement to more telehealth impacted disparities in healthcare? You know, it's that's a good question. So we definitely saw um, where some people, you know, where they don't necessarily have the best broadband things, or just some people are very um, distrustful of telehealth. They feel like they're all their businesses out there. However, I actually have seen it in the in the good sense where people who, you know, uh, transportation is an issue. Um, they can do telehealth. You know, mom's not missing a half day of, of, of work because, you know, we can get it where mom's there and the kids there or the parents there and there. And, you know, we're they're not missing a whole half day of work. So I will say that has been um, impactful. Um, and helpful for a lot of, for a lot of patients. Um, so I've seen it, the, 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 I will honestly be, honest, and again, this is my, my lens, it's probably been very, a little more helpful um, in my patients. Um, I'm still amazed how many young people um, don't want to, they prefer to come to the office. Uh, so you would think, you know, they're always on their phones. Of course they want to do a telehealth visit. Um, but yeah, I've, I've actually seen and used it quite, um, uh, as a, as a nice tool. 
you know, they can do, we've done a telehealth visit, you know, they're in the car, not driving, you know, but they're going from one to, they pull over and we're doing a visit and then they go off to do whatever thing else they need to do. How do you recommend we bring this into our nursing programs? There seems to be a lot missing, especially in smaller communities where there are few, if any, people of color. Mm. Wow, um, thank you for that question. I think you, you, we really, we need to do a better job of re recruiting our nurses of color. But the, as we recruit, having those conversations um, and really at, telling people, okay, you know what, these, you know, whether it's uh, having panels, interacting with more diverse people, um, knowing all those things, we, we have to do a better, better job of, of improving, I think, our, our recruitment pool for nurses. Um, but but continue it's it's again weaving these discussions in part of the curriculum and then when people graduate it's not a one and done we continue to have these conversations so you're building on those skills because there's nothing like once you you've read about it but then when it happens to you on the job you're like okay let, I can I can use those skills that I've I've I've, I've learned but continue to um, uh, sharpening those skills is actually really really important. Could you address the role of literacy and health literacy and the SDOH? What ways are there to de-silo health and education efforts to help build equity early in life? Oh, wow. Um, Y'all deep tonight. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> you know, that, that, is, that, is a, that is a question. I, um, so, so let's go, it's health equity and health literacy. So health literacy. This is going to sound, so, we have to make sure that we're talking in simple, non-healthcare speak to our patients. And regardless of their economic of, or, or background, true story, there was a relative of mine who was having some pain, went to the doctor and was like, they were like, well, the came back and was like, yo, well, the doctor just told me to take some ibuprofen. I said, You've been taking ibuprofen. And they said, no, I've been taking Motrin. And I'm like, and this person has like three degrees. Like, you know, so healthcare literacy is a big thing. We all, we think about it at the, you know, just reading level, but we have to talk and, and just, and, and keep it simple. I'm a person about keep it simple, but when, but, and we have to make sure it's available in all languages that we have adequate um, interpretation services, all those things. So we have, to, there is a lot of, lot of work we have to do. Um, I don't even know where to start with that one, but yeah, um, I, I'll start with that. Um, this other person wants to know if there's anything or that you're aware of anything right now for helping um, undocumented immigrants, migrant farm workers, homeless populations to get COVID vaccines. You know, what do we do for the people who can't get to the pharmacy or can't sign up online? Yeah, so my my understanding, and actually, I'm just going to say this because this was just on the news last night. There are some organizations working with um, the the food industry and healthcare industry to uh, to uh, not healthcare industry, the agriculture industry, particularly migrant workers working on um, getting COVID vaccines. I do not, I cannot speak to particular in any initiatives. But I know that's something there where people groups are looking at as part of the rollout. I think the biggest thing now is we just don't have enough vaccines. Um, and it's it's almost a good problem. I'm happy to have, see people want the vaccine. The sad part is we can't get enough out there. So I would hope um, there will be some type of initiative where we're. So the one thing is, I will say, is that they we have been. Um, uh, reaching out to some communities, especially our Latinx community in Grand Rapids, um, and doing some community um, vaccination uh, community clinics, like we have one um, at churches and in a community center, and letting people know that you can come. We're not we're not checking your doc uh, documentation status, but getting out. I think it's going to be a bigger push um, to getting out into the more agricultural areas. So more to come. Um, the next person would kind of like to know where they might start initiating this conversation um, because they work for an organization that has ignored it entirely, ignored any kind of conversation about race, even with all the changes happening in the world. How would you bring it up to acknowledge that there might be some changes that need to happen? Wow. So 
one of the things you can do is say, you know, if you're, you know what, I went to this webinar and hope they were hosting and this is what I thought was, I mean, a lot of times that is a good way to bring it up. Um, are there ways to give leadership feedback? Um, and, and how do you push for it? And it could be, you know, depending on your role in the organization, how can you do what? So if you're in a role where you can say, you know what, these are some of the things I want to do. I want to have where we have this, you know, equity moment or talk about this, or depending on what you're doing, um, how can we reach our, because this is other thing, business minded, how can we do this to make sure our business, we're impacting our customers and having the best experience for our customers. Sometimes you have to come at it with a, um, uh, a customer experience or, you know what, if we do this, we can bring more people in we can make more money. I mean, so not knowing the specific situation, those are just some of the techniques that you could try to use. What advice do you have for people who experience a healthcare professional who may have been microaggressive or dismissive? Oh, that, that's hard. That, that's a good one. So you could be the type, again, this depends on the person, really, you know, to say, hey, Dr. Jones, when you said that, when you called me colored, I'll use that one, because um, we don't use that word anymore. Or when you said, you know, was the chicken fried? And I'm just, these are examples that I know that have happened to colleagues or um, the color one actually was mine a few years ago. Um, we don't, we don't, you know, and educate. Or when you made that, you know, comment, um, that's the opportunity. The other opportunity, depending on what it is. So if you, you can always, the next level is we all have bosses. So whether it's, you know, one to have a discussion with that, um, the manager, or um, you could even, depending on the institution, um, d- uh, call their their uh, patient relations. But again, it was always would be great if you could have that conversation with that provider um, to give them that feedback, because sometimes they don't even know what that what they're doing is wrong. Um. This is a a thank you again and uh, in shared experience that so many of us white folks here in the Grand Rapids area have a challenge even acknowledging that we're racist and we do not recognize it in ourselves. This person's work encourages white people to listen. Is it okay to ask the places where you, Dr. Lowry, do not feel heard? Repeat that last part again. They they wanted to know if it was okay to see to see if you would be willing to share with us places where you might not feel heard. I think this is also a- oh where where, I've, where I not feel heard. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think um for me I will say sometimes I mean I'm fortunate enough I've kind of been here a long time um but I think sometimes if you're in those bigger settings where you're more in the kind of the business or the boardroom. Sometimes those are instances where you don't feel hurt, where you feel like, well, I just said that and so-and-so said it. And that was, that was my idea. They, they didn't say anything new. Um, I think sometimes those are times where you can also, if you have a mentor or someone that you can go and have those conver- those conversations with. Um, again, yeah, the, 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 it is hard because a lot of people are, are very uncomfortable, again, even saying like we we have a problem with race and racism. I mean, I'll be honest. You know, a few years ago, people didn't. You can't say racism because that's the R word, and no one wants to address it. People are gonna feel uncomfortable. Um, and I learned it's a descriptor. It's like being short or tall. You're racist. You can be racist. Um, and so not not minimizing, but you, you we got to do something about it. And again, kind of going back. If if we don't address it, it's not gonna get. If we don't face it, it's never gonna change. Um, this is an interesting one. It's not really a question. The person just said that, thank you for saying we all have biases. This is something I have never heard before. And it's so much more unifying than we typically hear that that seems to be that only white people have biases. So thank you for your wisdom and your passion. Oh, thank you. Yes, we have biases. I could look. Yeah, thank you. So I think that's all of our questions we got answered pretty much. Some of them were kind of duplicates. So we have all of our questions answered for tonight. Well, thank um, you. I, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, and again, you know, we're, we're all at different levels of the journey, but keep, you know, and it can be overwhelming and just hardening, but I, I, I think things are going, to, we're, we're, things will hopefully get better. Um, 
We'll see. <laughs> I'm optimistic and hope. Well, thank you everyone for your attendance and your attention tonight. And thank you again, Dr. Lowry. We really appreciate you being here with us to have this very, very important conversation. Um, and thank you and um, good night. Thank you.